morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today we're actually going to start out with a viewer question. And that's because I want to use uh, that part of the show to kind of put the brakes on the spirited discussion we're having about Marvel versus the rest of Hollywood. And I just want to clarify some things and try and inject a measure of calm into the discussion. Because at the end of the day, as some of you have pointed out, we're all just movie fans and, you know, nobody can last at number one forever. And we're having a discussion about the current number one, uh, you know, slipping a little bit and, you know, what needs to be done, if anything, to regain that number one position. And I'm going to, you know, really make clear where I stand on this. Uh, and I hope that a number of you uh, can also, you know, put your thoughts down below in the comments. But again, I'm asking you, uh, as we continue this discussion, which we're all clearly very interested in, to please be respectful of uh, not just myself, uh, but, you know, I can take it, you know. Uh, but I would also ask you uh, to be very uh, respectful of your fellow BTT viewers, even if they don't share the same uh, opinion as you do. Now, uh, I think, by the way, uh, that Kevin Feige and company are obviously a little bit upset about what's happened with Jurassic World because of uh, a little uh, article that appeared, or graph, it's not really an article, it's just really a graph, in the Wall Street Journal that a few of you actually tweeted to me, and I tweeted my response uh, this morning as well, but I wanted to go over it here. Uh, and basically, the Wall Street Journal uh, said that when you adjust for inflation, even from 2012, that the Avengers is still the biggest opening of all time. And my response was, hey, well, if you're going to play that game, uh, Gone with the Wind is the third biggest grossing film of all time, unseating the Avengers from that number three spot. And even more uh, amazing, Twitter doesn't have enough characters for me to tell you this, but Gone with the Wind, that's just its domestic gross. That's $1.6 uh, billion domestically, because they didn't really release films worldwide at that time, and they certainly didn't have a way to measure it. Uh, and there are a number of other films, uh, such as E.T., Sound of Music, that would also unseat a number of other films in the Billion Dollar Club if we were to adjust for inflation. So that's one of the reasons that they don't adjust for inflation, and they don't. But the reason I feel that that uh, Wall Street Journal article might be a bit of a plant is because it failed to mention the overall uh, change in the rankings if you were to also adjust for inflation. It only focused on the uh, opening weekends. And, it, you know, it's clearly a fluff piece to, you know, make Marvel look good and to really diminish Jurassic World's accomplishment, which is poor sportsmanship. If you lose, you lose, and then you have to move on to the next competition, right? Jurassic World, beat it out, and from now on, going forward, whenever anyone talks about unseating the, hot, the biggest opening of all time, it's going to be in reference to Jurassic World, until another movie unseats it. And there are various ways that can be accomplished by Marvel, such as we talked about in a movie math yesterday, if they were to cease this, you know, staggered release uh, that they do. And instead, like Jurassic World, open the film day and date worldwide, with the exception, again, of Japan for Jurassic World. Uh, but Marvel, they, they spread their uh, opening out about uh, over the course of a week or so, and the result is they don't post as big numbers. All right, so what did I want to talk about here? I really wanted to say that some of you have walked away with the idea that I'm upset with Marvel, or I now suddenly hate Marvel, or I've turned on Marvel. That is definitely not the case. Please remember that I actually really enjoyed Avengers Age of Ultron. I thought it was a great movie. I've seen it twice. I really enjoyed it. Although, I've seen M Mad Max twice as well, although the film that I've seen three times this year is actually Spy. Uh, and I love Mad Max. Mad Max is my favorite movie of the year. Uh, but, you know, my love of a movie has to be separated from judging how it's doing at the box office because money doesn't have a, a, a favorite, right? Money, the money numbers are black and white. They're actually the only way to judge a film, uh, you know, fairly. What, what's the breakdown financially? Because everything else is opinion based. I also awards wins, right? You can, you can argue that uh, a film doesn't deserve to be uh, like the best picture winner at the Oscars, but it still is. You can't change that, uh, as many animation fans know, sadly. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that the reason I'm being so tough on Marvel is because I'm worried about Marvel. I'm worried about my friends over at Marvel Studios. And many of you might say, oh, well, they don't need you to be worried about them. They still made a billion dollars. But you have to understand that this is relative, right? You know, like, well, how's Marvel doing in relation to how it should be doing? Also, you have to pay attention to what this could mean further down the line, right? Like, Avengers Age of Ultron is, like, at around 1.3 billion right now, which, again, is very impressive. I agree with many of you, okay, with what you're saying. But 
while it got people's money this time, what will happen the next time? Because many people, again, as we know, did not like Avengers Age of Ultron. I did, again, but I have two, not one, but two close friends who told me that they hated it so much they wanted to leave. Right? They wanted to walk out of the film, but they stayed because they had been so excited to go and see it uh, that they were like, okay, let's just see, maybe it'll get better. And they felt it never did. So will Marvel get their money the next time around? That's a really important thing for Marvel to be concerned about. And the fact that Marvel refuses to listen to a large part of its fan base, which is hugely dissatisfied, I think is a giant red flag, right? They just can't listen to the diehard fans like myself who are like, wow, I loved it, it was amazing. We're not talking like a Guardians of the Galaxy situation where I fully admit that I was in the vast minority with disliking that film. But here, I think the number of people who are dissatisfied with Avengers Age of Ultron is big enough to cause some concern for Marvel. I also see a total unwillingness to pay attention to changing trends in the superhero market. Uh, for instance, as I've said, I think things are going darker, which Marvel itself is contributing to with the superb Daredevil on Netflix, but yet the movies are unwilling to go into that territory, as Feige has said. Never say never, Feige. And I also, um, oh, oh, it's here. My notes are here, because I was going to go do this last, but I felt this needs to be discussed. I also think it's a horrible uh, situation with happened with Joss Whedon. I think to have someone leave your employee so horribly dissatisfied and angry is also a giant red flag. Like, why is Joss Whedon so angry? Uh, with Kevin Feige. It's almost like the beginnings of the rumblings that were coming out of the comic book business uh, when we began to see problems with, like, for instance, DC and the New 52. You were like, wow, it seems like things are poorly run there, the publisher. Uh, and indeed, that did turn out to be the case, and the New 52 imploded because it was so poorly run. Uh, and I kind of feel like, that's, I guess that's a very good uh, comparison, right? Like, when the New 52 began in the comics, it revolutionized the comic book business, and it dramatically increased sales, not just for DC, but across the board. And every Everyone was like, all hail DC, they saved the comic book business. But then, as many of us said, because we were like, you know what, these stories are horrible, uh, the thing couldn't uh, withstand it, you know, it couldn't uh, uphold the quality or its momentum. And we're now at a point where they're doing away. Uh, seemingly with the New 52. It was such a horrible situation because uh, while it was strong out of the gate, it just uh, had too many structural flaws. And I see similarities in what's happening with the MCU. Uh, also, the Black Widow problem isn't going away. In fact, it's getting worse. I think it's actually making a number of people upset with Marvel and Kevin Feige refuses to fix that situation or even really address it. Uh, even when you have people like Mark Ruffalo tweeting against you. I mean, that's really a problem. That's dissension in the ranks. Uh, also, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I think the MCU, while it originally started out as a great idea, where they're like, you have to see every movie if you want to understand what's going on. I, too, was like, what a great idea. It's like TV serialization in movies. Brilliant. But then we're seeing a really big problem emerge on two fronts. One, it's creating a situation where films have, are so uh, have to focus on being interconnected uh, to the point where they actually hurt the film itself at hand, which is what Joss Whedon said happened with Avengers Age of Ultron. So that's problematic. And for those of us who are comic book readers, we're used to that. We're used to sowing seeds for other films. Uh, but I think that your regular casual moviegoer is not, and is like, this seems incomplete. And we're like, well, of course, you have to read the other issues, or in this case, watch the other movies. And that doesn't seem to be something that's a satisfying experience to the non-comic book reader. And the other thing is, is that we have viewers now who are getting lost, who are like, I don't remember every little thing that happened in the other movies. I don't know this little bit of information that comic book fans know because they've read the comics and follow the characters. Uh, I've had many of you tell me that your friends need you to decipher what's happening in the movie for them because they aren't aware of the ins and outs. And I think that is also something that cannot sustain itself. So I think that Marvel, um, I'm glad they've had their success, but I think this unwillingness to take a hard look in the mirror and to listen to the feedback from its viewers is uh, a really troubling development, and I worry about what it's going to mean for the movies further down the line, uh, especially when I think DC is going to come on like gangbusters in 2016 and really dominate. Suicide Squad, I haven't seen anything as powerful or as potent as Suicide Squad in terms of online interest and audience interest in general 
for like quite some time. I'm amazed by it, and I think that um, DC has something special on their hands. Uh, I think that's gonna. I think it's gonna surprise people how well it does. All right, so that's the first story. Uh, that's the viewer question section of the episode, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you down below. But please know, I don't hate any movie studio. I don't hate any individuals in Hollywood. Uh, I'm just being brutally honest. Uh, as we all should, you know, uh, you know, fandom shouldn't cloud uh, our analysis of the movies, right? It's like, oh, I would love this to do better, but I can admit that it's not. All right, so what are the three stories of the day? Well, uh, the first is that Channing Tatum has finally found a director for Gambit. Now, uh, he didn't get anybody as prestigious as he was hoping to get. He, he searched high and low, and I do respect him for trying to get such a, you know, prestigious director attached to the property, but he couldn't do it. And he ended up with Rupert Wyatt. Now, some of you might be like, hey, Grace, Rupert Wyatt directed Rise of the Planet of the Apes. He's awesome. And that's exactly what Fox and Channing Tatum want you to think. Uh, because they're not mentioning that he also directed a little movie called The Gambler with Mark Wahlberg, which was one of the worst movies I ever saw. Like, it was so bad, it inspired me to make, for the first time last year, uh, a top ten worst movies of the year for 2014. Because it was just so awful. I was angry watching it. Uh, now, I don't know if that was Rupert Wyatt's fault. I think it was largely the screenwriter's fault and Mark Wahlberg's fault for producing it and, you know, really just making such a horrible movie. But still, I think you have a situation where I think uh, Channing Tatum wanted um, a director who would elevate the material, uh, but instead he's gotten one that I don't that I don't think detracts from it per se, but at the same time needs Gambit more than Gambit needs Rupert Wyatt. But anyway, it's not the worst director he could have gotten, and I do think that The Gambler, as bad as it was, looked good. It was a very attractive film, and it looked like a prestige film, so perhaps that uh, Rupert Wyatt can bring the, that quality to The Gambit movie that Channing Tatum obviously is very invested in. Also, interestingly, it will start shooting in October, so very soon we'll probably be getting our look at Channing Tatum as Gambit, which I'm very curious to see. Will he have like the headgear thing on? I wonder if Channing Tatum can pull that off. Will he grow his hair out? A uh, lot of important questions there for the uh, for us Gambit fans, of which there are many. Alright, so the second story of the day is that Maleficent 2 is moving forward at Disney. And the reason that that is, uh, the reason that's been confirmed, I think many people expected there to be a Maleficent 2. It made a ton of money uh, at the worldwide box office. Very successful. And I believe Angelina Jolie's biggest movie ever at the box office, uh, similar to Brad Pitt's World War Z, uh, which is the biggest movie of his career, which is also getting a sequel. But anyway, the reason that this is now officially moving forward is that Linda Wolverton, the screenwriter, has signed a deal to write the sequel. And Angelina Jolie, while not signed for Maleficent 2, is being kept in the loop to develop it. She was very hands-on in the first film, and that looks to be uh, the case again with the second film. And Linda Wolverton, of course, a big Disney talent in the writing department, uh, wrote Beauty and the Beast back in the day, wrote the Alice in Wonderland script, you know, uh, one of the first films ever to join the Billion Dollar Club, you know, the Tim Burton, Johnny Depp, Mia Wasikowska film. And then, of course, she wrote Maleficent. She also worked on The Lion King as a, uh, one of the screenwriters on that film as well. However, I think what's interesting here is that many people had big problems with Alice in Wonderland and Maleficent. I think they are the two most contested Disney live-action fairy tales to date, uh, where every time somebody brings them up, they're like, yeah, but I didn't like it. I know, I loved both those movies, but again, I'm recognizing that most people did not like them. So I'm very curious, as uh, Disney moves forward with sequels for these live-action fairy tales, if they can, you know, sustain a sequel, if people will forget and be like, well, you know, I didn't like the first Alice in Wonderland, I didn't like Maleficent, but you know what? I'll give it another shot. Or uh, has that bad taste that was left in so many moviegoers' mouths uh, not going to go away? I, I think it's a very interesting question indeed. I also would like to ask you, I was thinking about this actually the other day, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we realized that while we enjoy the Disney live-action fairy tales, we have no desire to watch them Again, like you see them once and you're like, okay, I'm done. That was awesome. And I'm curious if any of you, you know, like with the Disney animated fairy tales, you can watch them on a loop. They're fantastic. They're like a good bedtime story. They're wonderful. Uh, everybody wants to own them and just watch them again and again and again. But with the live action fairy tales, I'm curious, how many of you have purchased them and how many of you have watched them more than one time? All right, now the third story of the day, I was reluctant to include this. I wanted to actually talk about Forrest Whitaker uh, in negotiations to jo uh, join Star Wars uh, Rogue One, which I guess we'll have to talk about tomorrow. Uh, some story had to get cut for this Maleficent 2 news. But I had a number of you, actually someone was like, 
Why aren't you covering the Fantastic Beasts story? Everybody else respects this movie and you don't. And as I've said before, it's because nobody seems particularly interested in Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. Again, it's the third story of the day, which never gets included in the metadata or the poster frame for an episode of Morning Movie News, uh, and therefore is usually the story that uh, drives the least amount of traffic. And I just think that people just don't seem very interested in this movie. And I have to tell you, while I'm glad that Kate Upton didn't get this female lead role that she was up for, I don't like who they chose either. Uh, they chose Catherine Waterston, uh, Waterston, who's actually the daughter of Sam Waterston of Law & Order fame, and also he was on the newsroom uh, as the, the boss of the network, uh, Jeff Daniels' boss. But she's been cast as the lead of Tina, which is a witch living in the U.S., and she meets Newt Scamander in, in his travels in New York City to catalog Fantastic Beasts. Uh, Catherine Watterson was in Inherent Vice. That's kind of how she got her big splash. She's done a lot of projects, but that's her biggest one to date. Uh, I really disliked her in that movie. I disliked the movie overall, but it didn't stop me from really liking Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Josh Brolin's performance in the movie. But Catherine Watterson really, like, grated on my nerves. I was not a fan of her work. Uh, I feel almost to some degree she's like nepotism at its worst, right? When someone gets work who really shouldn't because, you know, they're, they're ingrained in the industry and have a lot of connections because of their parents, or in this case, parent, uh, but she's gotten now a huge role with the, this lead in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, now, I would have gone with the, uh, the third choice for the role, Elizabeth Debicki, who was in The Great Gatsby and is also the blonde villainess in the upcoming The Man from U.N.C.L.E. I think she's a very good actress, but also at the same time, not particularly likable either. I think it's weird they want to cast someone in this role who isn't very likable. Um, and that's, uh, I think, what's concerning me the most about Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is that there seems to be a disjoint in the image of the American witches and wizards from the UK witches and wizards. Like, the UK witches and wizards were just like the, like, they had a coziness factor to them. Like, a real upstanding, like, almost Walt Disney-esque uh, quality, or Charles Dickensy, right? You're like, you are just like the ideal British person. And I think that's being continued with Eddie Redmayne in the role of Newt's commander. You're like, you're just so perfect. I just want to hang out with you, and you make me just feel that the world is a great place. But I feel that with the American actors they're casting, you know, at least so far with Cat Catherine uh, Waterston and who else they were considering for the role, you don't have that same quality with the American witches and wizards. So I'm curious, you know, one of the great things about Harry Potter, the, the Harry Potter films, is it was a universe you wanted to be in. So I worry that for the this new group of films with Fantastic Beasts, will this universe have that same... Uh, quality to it, that you're like, I just want to be in that world. You'll be like, yeah, this one seems kind of crummy. I don't like it. Uh, so I'm curious, what do you think of the casting of Katherine Waterston? Luckily, very few people saw Inherent Vice, uh, so she's a fresh face to many. Uh, but for those of you who did see it, she was the uh, ex-girlfriend of Joaquin Phoenix who kept coming to visit him in his beach house and sp spoke like in riddles and rhymes. Uh, and I'm curious, what do you think of her, and do you think she's a good female lead uh, for the film? All right, thank you so much. That's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please write down below what you think of today's top three stories and that viewer discussion point about Marvel versus the rest of Hollywood. Uh, and then also, of course, what you'd like to see covered tomorrow. Uh, any question, And any questions, of course, that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.